Today we're going to be reading from the book of Nehemiah. Now I'm going to warn you, um, Pastor Josh is much better than me. Um, and what I'm going to do this morning is lean on the word of God because I feel like you can't go wrong if you just lean on it. So we're going to be what I call word heavy today. We're going to be reading a lot of scripture because it's just going to need a little bit of explaining. But God's word is more powerful than anything that you can hear come from my mouth. And so we're going to dive into the word this morning. So if you don't like reading, you can listen. That's okay, but we're going to have it on the screen for you. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and get them out. Get your Bible app ready to go. Or you can turn to the screen behind me. We call it the big Bible in the sky. You can check that out. But we're going to read together. We're going to be in the book of Nehemiah. And I'm going to be reading right now in chapter 4, verses 6 through 15. If you got it, say got it. If you're watching, say watching. All right, come on. So Nehemiah 4, 6 through 15. So we rebuilt the wall to all of it had reached half its height, for the people worked with all their heart. Something about doing something with people that are doing something with all their heart. But when, I'm not going to try to say these names, so we're going to call them the enemy. Cool? That's what they are. So we're just going to call them, say it what it is, and not try to announce these words, pronounce these words. So, uh, but when the enemy heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. And they all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out. There's so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Also, our enemies said, before they know it or see us, we'll be right there among them and we'll kill them and put an end to their work. Then the Jews who lived near our enemy came and told us 10 times over, Hey, wherever you turn, they will attack us. Therefore, I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall, the exposed places, posting them by families. I want you to remember this. He posted them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. After I looked things over, Nehemiah says, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord. Say, remember the Lord. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome. And fight for your families, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. And when our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to our own work. The title of today's message is, We is Greater Than Me. We is Greater Than Me. And let's pray before we go any further. Father, we love you. Lord, we just open our hearts, minds, ears to you this morning. God, we thank you for your word and its relevance to our lives, even now today. Old and New Testament, your word remains powerful. Help us to see and hear what you want to show us today as we study your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You know, I was thinking as I was getting ready this week about this we greater than me and um, it, it drew me to a, a real frustration of mine, and that's, uh, if you have kids, you're going to really relate to this. So it's the moment after we finally get our kids in bed, after the 10-hour process, that it takes to actually get them in their bed and us out of the room. And then we walk downstairs, my wife, Dana, and I, we walk downstairs. We've got a 4-year-old and 2-year-old. We finally get them to sleep. We get downstairs, and you know, it's, you get these two kids to sleep that you've been, like, literally keeping them breathing. Like, all they want to do is try to end their life. And you're just trying to make them eat, you know, like they're trying to jump off things and do things. It's like this moment where you feel like you can finally relax a little bit, that they're asleep and it's just you and your wife. And so you just kind of, you breathe a sigh and you walk downstairs and then there's the hurricane that is left over from their just craziness that day. If you've got kids, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's that awful moment where you were about to relax and then you realize there's hours of work to do. And so, um... So me and my wife, Dana, we, we do this. We do it every night. We go downstairs or, um, you know, sometimes she's got something to do upstairs. And so I'll go downstairs and start cleaning. But there's this one section of our kids' playroom that drives me bananas. I mean, it really gets under my skin. And when I go in there, and it's, it's really small. It's this basket that is filled with these little styrofoam blocks. It's tons of them. And they, lo- they don't even like to play with them. Like, they just like to pick it up, dump them out, and be like, cool. And they're on to the next thing. <laughs> Like, they don't even really build with them anymore. It's just there. We should get rid of that. Um, but 
But anyway, so I hate this because it's the most annoying thing to pick up, and it takes forever, especially if you're by yourself. It's like you can only grab like a couple at a time, and there's a million. So you're literally sitting there forever trying to pick up these blocks, and you start getting mad. Like you start getting frustrated. You know when you're picking up your kids' toys, if you, if you have kids, if you don't, just it's coming. or uh, Just try to relate with me here. So um, you start picking up toys. You're like, they never play with this. This is going in the garage sale. I could burn this right now. And, and that's how I feel about these blocks. So I'm picking up the blocks. I'm putting them in things. I start saying cuss words in my head because it's taking forever. And I'm just, I'm really mad because, you know, I'm not really cussing. It's just holy cussing. It's in my head. So, so I start putting, and it's just, it's so frustrating. But I've kind of combated that a little bit. I don't do it after the kids go to sleep anymore. Normally I make them help me. And I make it into a game. So it's like whoever can get the most blocks in the tub before it's over wins. Do I let the kids win ever? No. It's, they've kind of tricked me. I end up picking up most of the blocks anyways because I'm trying to win. And sometimes Osley claims that she wins, and I let her think that, but I win. And, uh, and so th- they help me, but we get it. I mean, we're just boom, 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 blocks, and they're helping. You know, normally it's like slow motion for them, but now that it's a game, they're helping. They're going really fast, and we're done like that. Uh, and then sometimes Dana is able to, you know, help me pick them up, and, and it's not so stressful. Like, I feel like if I'm doing it with someone, it's, it's not that bad. But if I have to pick it up by myself, it's the end of the world. It takes forever. It takes years. And I, and I was thinking about this, and I was like, man, how, that applies so much to this book and, and this principle of we is greater than me. You know, we hear things all the time like teamwork makes the dream work, and we're better together. And those are very true. And there's actually a principle Um, a value that we have in our church. It's called, We is Greater Than Me. I'm going to read it for you. It says, Because me first makes me miserable, we prefer others above ourselves. We believe what we are a part of is bigger than the role we play. We happily know that this is not about me. And it's talking about the value of putting others before yourself. And that's really the whole mission of the church. But it also, I love the part where it says, we believe that what we're a part of is bigger than the role we play, which means that you have a part to play. That God created his church, capital C Church, with you in mind, with a role for you to play, with a part that you need to be doing. And so we're going to talk about that today. And when I read this value, it reminded me of Paul in 1 Corinthians 12. Paul is talking about the body of Christ, and he's getting very visual with it. He's talking about the hand and the eye and how, how weird would it be if the eye was the hand or the hand was the eye and how that would be kind of weird and um, how you don't need, pe- you know, it doesn't matter whether you're seen or unseen. Every part of the body is just as important. And you can't see my heart right now, but if I didn't have it, I wouldn't be here. You can't. There's so many parts. Every part of the body is so crucial. If you've ever, like, you know, jammed a finger. It seems like not a big deal, but it's really annoying and really hurts, and you just wish that it would work properly. Um, The the little things, even the little things, the seen and unseen, everything matters. And he's talking about this, and, you know, we all have a valuable part to play, but the part only means anything if we start playing it. The other thing I was thinking about in this scripture was, you know, a one giant me would be kind of weird. You know, if I'm a part of the body of Christ and my part is, let's say, an eyeball and my eyeball is the size of my head and the other one's a normal size, that's kind of weird. You know, that's kind of like, or if my face was just the size of my mouth, like my mouth took up my whole face, that would be a monster. Have you seen Monsters, Inc.? Kazowski, anybody, yeah. So, so it's not an attractive thing. Like me, 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 a big me attitude is not attractive. It's not, distract, it's not attractive. It's not going to help us accomplish it, anything. We've got to get out of this me mindset and start having a we mindset. It's why we were created. You know, it's, this culture is so pump me up. Hey, look what I'm doing. Hey, me, me, me. What relationships can I build to help me get to where I'm going? I, I, me, me. And, and it's so opposite of what God created us to be a part of. Everything that he did when he created you when he created me, was to be a part of a team, part of a we that glorifies him, not a me that glorifies myself. And so as I was thinking about that, I was like, okay, if God views us as a body, and it's his desire that we all contribute, contribute, work together, build together, and everyone plays their part, then what is my part? 
Like, what am I supposed to be doing? What can I do best to serve and glorify the body of Christ? And so I was thinking about, okay, well, where else does this apply? You know, most things in the New Testament are pointed at a we. Like, like when Paul wrote most of the New Testament, those letters aren't addressed to an individual. They're addressed to churches. They're addressed to people. It's, it's a we mindset. God is continually speaking to us through we. He doesn't say a lot of individual things. He's always speaking to we. The prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us. Forgive us. So he's continually even just speaking and teaching to this collective we. And if the heart of God is we, then that's why we were created. And so I started thinking, you know what? Great things, great kingdom things can be accomplished when we understand this value of we is greater than me. And there was just a couple things that I wanted to share with you guys, a couple thoughts that I wanted to share with you regarding that. Number one is we can always accomplish things faster than me. You know, Nehemiah had the wall rebuilt in 52 days. Now, these stones are as wide as you can spread your arms, as tall as you can be. They're huge. I've been there. It's, it's insane what they were able to do in that time period. But to do that in 52 days, if he had tried to do that by himself, he never would have finished, probably would have quit and went home. He needed a team. He needed a we to accomplish this goal. And the only way that he was able to do that is it said that he built teams, but that they worked in families. I thought that was very interesting that he made the teams out of families and the importance of family in the part of we. So we can always accomplish things faster than me. We can always build greater things than me. We can always build greater things than me. That I feel like Nehemiah and the story of him building that wall is such a perfect um, picture of that. And Nehemiah's story is also a brilliant picture of the church. You know, Nehemiah was building these walls. He's building the walls of Jerusalem for, the, for a kingdom, an earthly kingdom. Well, you and I, we have a role to play. Our job is to build the kingdom of God here on earth. Plunder hell, populate heaven. That's why he put us here. Nehemiah also called upon families and individuals to join in the wall building. God calls upon families and individuals to join in the kingdom building efforts. See, he wants all of us to be a part. He wants all of us to play our part. But it starts with a very important piece, and that's prayer. It starts with prayer. Let's go back to the story of Nehemiah. We're going to be in chapter 1, and then we'll jump back to chapter 4. Nehemiah 1, 1 through 4. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hekeliah, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers came from Judah with some other men. And I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. So the Jews had been exiled, kingdom destroyed. They're out in Babylon. Persia's taken over. If you know 300, there's Xerxes, right? Xerxes was the king that, that was trying to you know fight and, and take over everything. Well, this is the, the king after him. This is Artaxerxes. It's the next king after him. And so somehow Nehemiah has become his cupbearer and hit some of his homeboys come in and they're like, hey, things back home are not good. It's, it's not good. And so they said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down. Its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Pause. So he hears that there's trouble. And before he does anything else, what is Nehemiah's first response? Prayed and fasted for days. Some of us, I feel like we are trying to get through this tough season that we've been walking in. And instead of stopping and praying and fasting and and hearing from the Lord, we're just working it out ourselves. We're just like, well, I'm going to figure this out. Friend, that's not going to be the best way to approach this. Whatever storm you're facing, you need to stop. You need to pray, and you need to fast. Then, when you feel peace from the Lord, you need to get moving. You know, I won't have time to read it, but Nehemiah, he stopped, prayed, and fasted for these days. He did not get an audible voice of the Lord moment. 
He did not have the Lord say, go build this wall. No, he prayed, fasted. He felt peace on here's what I need to do. I need to go rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And so guess what he did? He said, I'm going to go do it. First thing he had to do, approach the king, which he wasn't supposed to do and was very dangerous, and said, hey, my people are hurting. I want to go rebuild the walls of my homeland. The king could have had him killed just for that. But he found favor in him. God blessed that conversation. And he took that as a sign. Okay, my journey's blessed. Uh, also, while I'm at it, I need like some timber and some money and uh, papers to get me there too. Is that cool? And the king gives it to him. So, so what I get out of this is he didn't wait for, for God to be like, go and build that wall. No, he just, he prayed, he fasted, he felt like he knew what the Lord was saying to do, and he went and got to work. Some of you have been walking through a hard season, or you've been seeking vision from God, you've been trying to figure things out, and you've been waiting on a vision or an audible voice from the Lord or a sign that he's already given you, and you just need to get moving, start going, let him confirm what you need to do as you go, and then keep continuing on the path that he's laid for you. It's not time to wait. It's time to pray. It's time to fast. And there's time to move. So let's get to chapter 4. So Nehemiah chapter 4, 6 through 19. So he gets to Jerusalem, and then he says, We rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height. For the people worked with all their heart. But when the enemy, again, we're not trying to pronounce those, heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble. Mm. The enemy. You know, sometimes I feel like we can get going in life and uh, we have these attacks, you know, these things, these storms that we have to walk through. How many of you know that, that it's real easy, like when things are going good for you and you don't have to come up against anything, life just seems like, like you don't have to put a lot into it. You know what I mean? Like you're just kind of coasting. I feel like when we have these attacks, when we have these moments that we have to face something, for me, I take that as confirmation that God has something big for me to do. He has something big for me to step into, and I'm not going to let that keep me from it. I feel like there's some people here this morning that you've been walking through some hard things, and there's no minimizing it. It's been difficult. It's been hard. And the enemy has heard what you could do. He has heard, wait. So you're starting to get your life right? Some of you have been making some decisions. I'm going to stop doing this. I'm going to start doing this. I'm going to start going to church. I'm going to start getting in a small group. I'm going to start serving. And things start, or in your life starting to get a little chaotic. And you're like, wait, why am I doing this if things are going to get tougher? Well, what happened is you started doing something for the kingdom of God. And the enemy who wasn't worried about you at first, his ears are kind of perked up now. And he's like, hold on a minute. You don't need to be going that way. You don't need to be accomplishing great things. Let's, let's get some attacks going. Let's start coming up against that. See if we can get that stopped before it gets started. So if you're facing some things, don't take that as attack from God. No, that's confirmation that the enemy is trying to still kill and destroy what God has created you to do. So we need to face it knowing what it is, but knowing that God is greater. Amen. Amen. So what did they do to combat this? They prayed. It says in in verse 9, but we prayed to our God and posted guard day and night to meet this threat. If you're going through a tough time and you haven't been praying, you need to start praying. That is your next step. Pray. Get before God. If you've never done it before, if it feels weird, I promise you, if you'll step out of your comfort zone and start to lift up the name of Jesus, he's going to meet you where you are in the middle of whatever you're facing. So verse 10, meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out, and there's so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Negative. Also, our enemies said, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them, and we're going to kill them and put an end to the work. Negative. Negative. Then the Jews who lived near our enemy came and told us ten times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. Negative. How many of you know sometimes you start trying to do things for the Lord, there's a lot of negative people that can keep you from that. Sometimes you gotta, you got to get out of that negative headspace. Get some positive people in your life. And as I was reading this, you know, I noticed in verse 12, the Jews who lived near them had to come and tell them, that they would be attacked. That means that those Jews weren't helping them build the wall. They were real quick to get vocal and be like, hey, something's happening. Just want to let you guys know. 
they were real quick to be like, get on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram or whatever and be like, hey, bad things are happening. The world's not doing well. And they're real quick to say something, but they're not all about like getting in the dirt and building the wall. I think some of us have to be very careful because it's real easy to, man, bad things are happening. Bad things are going on. I'm going to sound the alarm. I'm going to tell you that, that this is wrong, I'm gonna t- but I'm not really going to get in the dirt and do the work to make a difference. I like to talk about it. It's just the doing something about it part that, that I'm not too excited about. We've got to be careful. We've got to be careful that we don't just be the ones that come and warn of trouble, but that we are doing something about it. And I think in a time, especially like right now, it's time for Christians to do less talking and more doing. We need to step up to the plate, be who God's called us to be, represent Christ the way that he's asked us to represent him. And that means we've got to change some things. So don't, don't like talk about it, be about it. You know what I'm saying? We got, we got to be about it. Anyway, sorry, I'm going to, I'm going to get off my horse there. Not just us, but we got to bring our family. Fathers, you got to bring your family to church. I can say that. You need to, you need to bring your family to church. Moms, you need to bring your family to church. Your kids need to come to church. And if your husband won't come, you grab his ear and you bring him too. <laughs> and you don't have any great excuses. You know, my wife gets my two kids ready by herself, gets them fed, gets them clothed, gets them out the door. I'm here early normally. Whatever excuse is, if you need help, get help. But if you can be here, if it's not, obviously there's sickness and, and things, it's very good reasons for you to watch online. And we're so glad that you're watching us online. We, we're so grateful that you're a part of our church and we love you. But if you can be in the house of the Lord with the people of God, you need to be here. It's one thing to, it's one thing to get a text from someone saying, I love you and I'm praying for you. That's good and we need it. But it's a whole nother thing for someone to come put their hand on your shoulder. Say, I love you. Look you in the eye. I've been praying for you. Actually, I'm going to pray for you right now. And they declare the words of the Lord over your life. You need some people in your life. And you need to bring your family. So then it says, therefore, I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. And after I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, I read this part in my brave part voice in my head. I'm not going to do it out loud, but I just like, I couldn't read it without the Scottish, like Mel Gibson accent. I was like, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord. Remember the Lord. Some of you have been going through a hard time. You need to stop and remember the Lord who has gotten you through everything that's led you to this point. You need to remember the Lord who is great and mighty, who can do all things. Sometimes we try to we try to try to take care of things ourselves. You need to stop, pray, and remember the Lord. Remember the Lord. Who is great and awesome. Fight for your families, your sons, your daughters, and your wives and your homes. I get like fired up reading that part. Like, Let's go. I'm ready to fight. Verse 15, when our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to our own work. Probably heard them getting fired up from that speech. Was like, we ain't gonna mess with that. I think for some of you this morning, and I'm even preaching to myself, when there's a plot or an attack of the enemy in your life, we sometimes just need to speak what it is. You just need to call it out. Enemy, I see this is an attack from you. You're not gonna have my health. You're not gonna have my family. You're not gonna have my kids. You're not gonna have my friends. I see you. I see what you're doing. And I have a God who is greater and stronger, and he's going to fight for me. He's going to win victory. And maybe if you'll just call it out and get a little vocal about it, the enemy might just be like, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm just going to. I mean, it's not promise, but I'm telling you, there's something about speaking to things that are as which they are. If the enemy is coming against me, if there's a lie being spoken over me, I'm going to address it. And I'm going to speak to the enemy knowing that I stand with a faithful God who's going to win and fight for me. We've got to get confident in our faith. It's not time to be timid in our belief in God and Jesus and who they are. Like, he is who he says he is. And I'm going to be bold about that. And I think that's what we need to be in this season that we're living in. Your part is important. 
So from that day on, half of my men did the work while the other half were equipped with all their stuff. Those who carried materials did their work with one hand and held a weapon with the other. And each of the builders wore his sword at his side as he worked. But the man who sounded the trumpet stayed with me. This part stopped me for a second. It says, the man who sounded the trumpet stayed with me. And I started to think about the trumpet player. You know, what if he got bored? Like, think about the, all this work's going on, and he's just standing with Nehemiah in the hot sun. I mean, I've been to Jerusalem. It is hot. And he's standing there holding his trumpet and just waiting. Man, no shade. It's hot. I'm sweating. This is not fun. Like, what if I think about what if the trumpet player had just decided, you know, this part's kind of boring. I think I'm going to put this down and go help build the wall. You know, like, I'm just going to put this down. I'm going to go help build the wall. And maybe he just left his post. Or what if the trumpet player, like, one day decided, you know what? This is a boring job. I never, the enemies never comes. I never get to blow this thing. It's like a waste of time. I'm just going to not show up today. And that time that he makes that decision is the time that the enemy comes. And all of a sudden, that part that seemed like not important or boring, all of a sudden is the difference in victory or loss. It's the difference in a wall and a kingdom being rebuilt and nothing being accomplished. And I was thinking about how that applies to us and how it applies to me. Like, what if one day I just woke up and decided to not do what God's called me to do? You know, Jesus is going to do his thing anyways. But maybe things could have been easier if you just would have played your part. Like, I think God's given some of us in here gifts to do things that no one else can do how we do it. And we haven't taken the time to figure out that God's given us that gift so that we can glorify him, so that we can serve him, so that others can be brought into the family of Christ. And it's time for us to quit being so like timid with our gift or, or being so worried about what part we're playing. Like I wonder if the person that's parking this morning decided that they just didn't feel like parking cars. Or if my friend that's lost that I've been praying for, like if he showed up that day and no one smiled at him. And no one greeted him as he walked in the door. And there was no one to watch his kids while he came in here and distraction-free could, could focus on the word of the Lord. And, and no one was, was praying for him. And no one was getting him in a small group. The Lord could still reach him. But my goodness, it would be easier if someone was playing their part and holding the trumpet and ready to blow it when the enemy came. Guys, we've got to be ready. If you don't know what your part is, you need to go to Next Steps today. It's happening right after service. No excuses. We'll watch your kids. We'll feed you. What else can you want? You just need to go to Next Steps. We'll teach you what your gifts are, and we'll help you learn how to use those to serve Jesus. And through being a part of a we, glorify him and make a difference. And there's no, I promise you there's no better feeling than doing what God's called you to do using your gifts to glorify him and watching what he does in the lives of other people. You've got to think about the trumpet player. When the time came, his part was important. And your part is important and you are needed. Amen. Then I said to the nobles, he says, the officials and the rest of the people, the work is extensive and spread out. We are widely separated from each other along the wall. Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us there and our God will fight for us. What God is saying here is if you'll just show up to the fight, he'll fight for you. But you can't be a part of a battle and just be an observer. Like if you're just watching, he can't, he's not going to do anything there. But if you'll just show up to the fight, he's going to move. You know, I was, I was thinking you can't have victory that you're not, victory in a battle that you're not showing up to. And church, we're going to build, we're building something right now. God is doing miracles here. I mean, we just bought this 11 acres, praise God. That's just the beginning. We have a beautiful house for the Lord that we're going to build. But in order to do that, we need everyone to be playing their part. That's why Next Steps is so important. That's why getting on the dream team is so important. That's why, that's why knowing what God's called you to do is so important. 
because we believe that thousands of people are going to be coming here to receive and to have their lives changed and to, to find Jesus and be set free and have salvation and make a difference. But we need each and every person. It's all hands on deck. And so if you haven't found a part to play, get to next steps. You know, First Timothy says that faith is a fight, to fight the fight of faith. So you can't just be a builder. You've got to be a fighter, which means you're going to have some battles to fight. It's not going to be easy. Being a Christian is not this hopping through the lily fields. Everything's good. Nothing's going to come against you. No, things will come against you. And you've got to be ready to build, but you've got to be ready to fight. And you've got to have some weapons with you. The Word of God is a sword. You need to have that thing with you ready to go, ready to fight. You need to be in your Word every day. You need to be praying so that you can get vision from God. You need to be in community so that people can help you see your blind spots. You've got to be ready to fight. And when we do this together, we can build great things. And so it was with Nehemiah. Nehemiah 6.15 says, So the wall was completed on the 25th of Elul in, the, in 52 days. Now, church, we're going to build. We're going to build what God's called us to build. We are going to do that. But it sure would be nice. If I could focus on what God's called me to build and do what I've been called to do and look to my side and see another family that's doing what they've been called to do and another family that's doing what they've been called to do and another family that's doing what they've been called to do and then we can build something great because the we can build it faster and bigger and better. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be a part of something just okay. I don't, I don't want to just be okay in life. I want to be a part of something great. And God's family, God's kingdom is the greatest thing that you could ever be a part of. So I want to give you three must-haves as we build the kingdom together. As we build. Number one, we must have a burden for God's people. Nehemiah had a burden for the people of Jerusalem. He heard that they were hurting. He had a burden for them. Jesus has a burden for you. He had a burden when he decided to, to do the things that he did so that we could have a relationship with the Father. You've got to have a burden for God's people. If you don't hurt for your friends that are lost, you need to start praying for them every day. Amen. Say, God, would you prick my heart every day for those that don't know you, for the people that need you, for the people that I know that have fallen away from you. You need to be praying for them. His burden stemmed from the feeling of the people's great need. However bad you have it, Somebody has it worse. And the only thing that's going to make you feel better is by helping someone else. Number two, we must have a vision for God's purpose. Nehemiah had a vision. And he got that vision by praying, fasting, and listening. But you've got to have a vision for God's purpose. You've got to know what God's called you to do and how he's called you to do it. And number three, we must have a commitment to God's purpose. We must have a commitment to God's purpose. You see, building things of value takes time, energy, effort, dedication, commitment. Nehemiah was willing to overcome people trying to kill him. He was willing to overcome the people that were speaking against what he was doing because he knew and was committed to God's purpose. If you're going to stay committed in hard times... You need to be surrounded by wall builders. You need to be surrounded by... It's real easy for a little bit to stay committed on your own. But when something starts to come against you, if you're isolated, it's going to be real hard to stay committed to what God's called you to. And you know this. You've walked through it before. But if the enemy comes against you, if things start to not go so well, if the storms of life start to rage and you're surrounded by people that are ready to fight with you, that are ready to build with you, that want to see God do great things with you, then you can walk through those storms confident, knowing that it's going to be over, knowing that God has you. You need to surround yourself with wall builders. You need to get in a small group. If you've never been in a small group, you need to get in a small group. We cannot do this alone. And the other thing I wanted to say is everyone else is going to try to talk you out of what God's called you into. If you start to take steps to do something special in the kingdom of God, there's going to be people that say, are you sure that's, like, are you sure God's really who he says he is? Like, is, is the Bible really true? Like, does that really still apply to us? You know, did he really mean that when he said this? 
Are you sure that giving that up is like, is that really what you're supposed to do? Surely God would be fine if you just, if you just did this. When you start to take steps to be more like Christ, there's going to be people in your life, people around you, voices that say, are you sure is that? They're going to start to doubt, and they're going to start to speak against So You've got to have the voice of the Lord and the voice of the Lord's people be louder than the voice of the enemy in your life. And the last thing that I want to say is we're not promised tomorrow. We're not promised tomorrow. So if you've been waiting and you've been trying to figure things out, it's the waiting time's over. The time to move, the time to act is today. Today is the time to move. Don't wait on tomorrow what God's called you into today. I'll say it this way. Don't keep carrying that burden that you've been wanting to get rid of for no reason when you could be gone tomorrow. Or you, why keep carrying it for all these years later when you could stop today and lay it at his feet? Some of you have been praying for freedom from addiction, from bondage. Don't leave here without laying it down at the feet of Jesus. I want to speak to some of you this morning that you've never really given your life to Jesus. Like you've never fully surrendered your life to him. Like you've been one foot in, one foot out, but you've never given him all of who you are. If that's you this morning, I'm going to give you an opportunity in a moment to, to really take a moment and surrender everything to him. Because nothing can change your life like he can. No one can change your life like he can. There's things that only he can do for you. So everyone across this room, if you'll bow your heads and close your eyes.